part of the um, Adult Christian Education Committee's responsibilities is to sort of brainstorm and coordinate a speaker for the Rector's Forum during Lent. And so when we were thinking about different options for this year, a friend of mine from Nashville recommended Dr. Getke. He, uh, my friend, his name is Ben Kane, and he's a graduate of the Vanderbilt Divinity School, and he had heard Peter speak, and also knew of his work with Manor House, and was just really impressed by him, and thought that he would be um, sort of a cool speaker, especially during the season of Lent here for us. And then when we emailed Dr. Getke initially about sort of his interest and availability, he um, suggested sort of this topic of holiness as a way of hospitality. He said, what does this mean? What does this look like? How do we become holy in a way that is welcoming and hospitable rather than self-righteous and hostile? And Richard felt like that was a really appropriate topic for Lent and something good for us to um, sort of jump off with uh, for discussion and thought. So with that, we are so glad to welcome Dr. Peter Get Getke. Uh, he is a uh, professor at Memphis Theological Seminary. Uh, and we really appreciate him coming and being here with us for this series. Thanks, everybody. It's great to be back. Why holiness and why hospitality? We are commanded uh, in both the Old and the New Testaments to be holy as God is holy. So that's pretty important. Um, if God is telling us to be holy, then we better get at it. And then why hospitality and how is hospitality linked to holiness? Our God is a hospitable God. And so if we're going to be holy as God is holy, we have to practice hospitality. How is our God hospitable? Uh, let me just give two examples. One, we live in a world created by God. God created this world in which we live. And it is a hospitable world, as Genesis says, and God saw that it was good. Now, I know that's not the whole story. We've mucked things up pretty good. We've sort of not done well with God's hospitality, but this is still a very hospitable world in which we are welcomed into this world, into this creation, and we get to enjoy all the beauty and the wonder of the creation, which in includes the beauty and wonder of each one of us who is made in the image of God. So God creates a hospitable world, and then God does something pretty magnificent, quite magnificent, God sends God's only Son into this world, and that Son of God shows us that what is central to being a disciple of Jesus and of God um, is the practice of hospitality. Jesus both extends hospitality and enjoys hospitality. Um, in fact, sometimes I like to say Jesus was a panhandler, uh, because you might, if you go through the Gospels, Jesus is often inviting himself to dinner. Um, it's one of, he relies upon the hospitality of others, but he is also creating spaces in which hospitality takes place, and he practices hospitality as he feeds the 4,000 and the 5,000, uh, as he heals people, as he welcomes people into the kingdom of God. So it's not surprising that when we read in the New Testament, um, about how we are to live in response to God's hospitality in our lives that we're invited into hospitality. So last week, we talked about two aspects of holiness and hospitality. The first one is separation. We are called out to be God's people. And in being called out to be God's people, that separates us from the way the world is. Uh, we're called to live into the kingdom of God, the reign of God, the beloved community. And that sets us apart from the way things are because we're living um, into the way things ought to be in the redeemed world. So the danger in that is that we can become self-righteous. Uh, we can become holier than thou. Um, and the way in which that self-righteousness gets undercut uh, is through remembering that our holiness is dependent upon the holiness of God. 
So it's not that we're holy, it's that God is holy and we are participating in that. And the first way in which we participate in that is solidarity with those who are on the margins. And why do we participate in solidarity with those on the margins? It undercuts our self-righteousness, for one thing, because we often want to think of ourselves as the ones who have it all together. And what God is telling us is that, no, we don't have it all together. In fact, all we have to do is look at how our society is structured, and we know that it, we don't have it all together. And also that God, as God, has identified with those who are on the margins. And we can see that in the Old Testament, as God identifies with the slaves who are in Egypt and not with Pharaoh. Uh, and in the New Testament, with whom, when we turn to the life and teaching of Jesus, Jesus is always going out to those who are on the outs. And in fact, um, let me ask a question. How many people have already been to church today? Already worship today? There's a really nice gospel. I think we share the same lectionary in the Roman and Episcopal traditions. So what was the gospel for today? The woman at the well. The woman at the well. Um, she was on the outs. How was she on the outs? She's a woman, first of all, in a very patriarchal society. That hasn't changed that much. <laughs> she had five husbands. That's what Jesus tells her, right? So it's kind of it'd be really fascinating to get to know that story, right? How did she how did she end up on her fifth husband? Because she's not like a, a Hollywood star or anything like that. So there's another way we can tell that she's on the outs. Where does Jesus meet her? At the well. Is she with anybody else? No, she's, she is at the well by herself. And the well in the ancient world was sort of like, I hesitate to say this, Starbucks maybe, but where it's a gathering place where people get together and talk, any kind of coffee shop or uh, restaurant, bar, where people usually go with others. And you know somebody's on the outs when they're at a place like that by themselves. So she's, and don't want to forget also, in terms of Jesus' own uh, religious and cultural tradition, what's her uh, religious background? She's a Samaritan. Ugh. Nasty old Samaritan. So she's on the outs that way as well. Jesus goes to her. And I heard a sermon yesterday that talked about this was not a detour on, on Jesus' part. Jesus is always going out to those on the outs. So solidarity. So now all of you who were here last week, you're caught up, more or less. Um, so that's our kind of Reader's Digest version of, of last week. Today we're moving on to two additional dimensions of holiness and hospitality. We're going to talk about service and simplicity. Next week will be sacrifice or self-giving and strength. And then the final week will be, to kind of wrap everything up, will be spirituality. So we have these seven dimensions of holiness and hospitality. So let's begin with service. I'm going to tell a couple of stories uh, to get us into the spirit of service. And they both come from my experience of serving at Manor House, which is a place of hospitality for people on the streets and people who are poor who are here in Memphis. Manor House is open three mornings a week from 8 to 11.30, and we offer hospitality in three ways. One, we're just a place where people can come and sit down and have a cup of coffee or a glass of water and just be there, sort of like at the well. And people come from the neighborhood, people come from as far as five or six or seven miles away, and almost everybody walks. A few people have bikes. So it's a gathering space. I, I like to call it a living room for people who are on the streets. So our first form of hospitality and serving is just to welcome people there, no identification required, um, no means testing, no interview, just come in whoever you are. In fact, we had a guy drive up occasionally for a while, he'd drive up in a Mercedes. He wasn't homeless or poor or anything. He was on his way to work, but he found out that we had good coffee. 
So he'd come in and get a cup of coffee, talk with folks for a little while, and head off to work, which was great. I mean, I, I really thought that was wonderful. So that kind of just come in and be there and be with friends and talk. Um, so that's going on. And then we do showers and a change of clothes uh, for men on Mondays and Thursdays and for women on Tuesdays. Uh, people sign up uh, in advance for that, a day in advance. So if you're showering on Monday, you sign up on Thursday. Unless we have extra room, then just come in, and that's going to tie into my story in just a bit. Um, and then the third thing that we do is we call socks and hygiene. 51 people sign up for socks and hygiene, and they come into our, what we call the clothing room, get a fresh pair of socks, travel size hygiene items, a shirt off the rack, and then depending upon the season, like if it's winter, they might get uh, a blanket, hat, gloves, coats, that sort of thing, shoes. Um, so we've got those going on, and you might think, 51 people, why 51? When we first opened, people were just lined up to get socks and hygiene, and we talked with people who were in the line, and they said, you know, if we're standing here in this line, we really can't sit down and enjoy a cup of coffee. So we got to get rid of that line. So we started just taking people's names. And we thought, how many can we serve in a hospitable way each morning, and also that we'd be able to sustain um, doing this day in and day out, because we didn't want to start something that we would then not keep going. So we thought 50 is a good number. But we were reading together from the letter of James, and I'm not going to remember the chapter and verse, but it says that mercy should triumph over judgment. So we thought we'll make it 51 instead of 50, just to remind ourselves that 50 is an arbitrary number and 51 is really arbitrary. So it just kind of reminds us that mercy always needs to triumph over judgment. So we often do what we call transcend the rules. We don't break the rules, we transcend them. We recognize that under certain conditions, uh, the rules are getting in the way of hospitality instead of facilitating hospitality. So if that's the case, then we transcend the rules. So sometimes we might serve 53 or 54. This, is, this goes on three days a week, uh, every week. It doesn't matter uh, what might fall on a Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday. If it's Christmas Day, we're still open. We have made a commitment to the people who are on the streets and in that neighborhood that no matter what, on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, we will be there to serve them. That's kind of the mundane aspect of service. And it does get to be a grind sometimes. It's not always uh, sunshine and happiness. Um, people get tired of us. We get tired of people. Sometimes we have arguments. And that's just between the volunteers. Um, <laughs> So things, it's not always easy, uh, but we say that we are there for the long haul, which means we want to be there in such a way that we can do this for the rest of our lives. So that's three mornings a week. Uh, no paid staff, we're all volunteers. Um, that's the, that's the kind of mundane realities of that service is doing the laundry, making the coffee, cleaning the showers, cleaning the toilets, um, mopping, sweeping the floors, taking out the garbage, all those things that have to be done in order to sustain hospitality. So for example, you all came in this morning and somebody had already made the meal. And then someone's going to be cleaning up. That's part of hospitality. And you can't have hospitality without preparation and cleanup. Th those are the mundane realities of hospitality. And you might think of God's service. God does a lot of mundane things like keep us alive. <laughs> right? We just kind of go through our lives day after day, and we don't even really think that we're being sustained in our existence at every moment by God, who is our creator. That's what Thomas Aquinas talks about creation. He said, we get kind of a false picture of creation, that it's some, something way in the past. It happened, you know, like Carl Sagan used to say, billions and billions of years ago. But really, theologically, our, what our faith affirms is that creation is going on every instant. That's what Aquinas talks about. We are being created and sustained in creation right now. 
that if God stopped creating us, we would cease to exist. So, but that seems mundane. I mean, day in and day out, we're not walking around thinking, poof, I could just disappear. We just kind of go through the dailiness of our lives. That's God's mundane hospitality. There's also an aspect of, of service that is not mundane. And there's, so here's kind of my second story. We were in the midst of a regular morning at Manor House, which means it was a morning of a organized chaos. We've got the coffee stuff going on, people milling about, drinking coffee, talking, playing Scrabble or chess, reading the newspaper, arguing about politics or religion, people coming in to get their clothing uh, before they go into the showers, people coming out of the showers, people coming in for socks and hygiene, people going out once they got their socks and hygiene, people's names being called, uh, all that kind of going on. And in the midst of that, and I was working the list that morning, which means I was the one who was calling people in for socks and hygiene or for the showers, um, I noticed sort of out of the corner of my eye that there was a man who was being pushed through our front door and he was in a wheelchair. And so I was not really paying attention. One of the guests came up to me and said, Pete, can, can this man get on the shower list? And it was about nine o'clock in the morning. And by nine o'clock in the morning, the shower list is always full, which means we've already taken 25 names and that's all we can do. So my first response was almost coming out of my mouth was to say no. And then I saw that the man in the wheelchair, there was something dripping from his chair. Uh, this guy, I don't know what that is, is like Coca-Cola or coffee or something, but he's really a mess. So I said, well, we'll see what we can do. And then three of, the, three of our guests who were sitting in the room said, he can have my spot. And that's a lot, because if you give up your spot, that means you're not gonna shower for at least another week. Because even though we do men showers twice a week, you can only sign up for one shower per week. But three of them said, he can have my spot. I said, okay, then we can work you in. And in fact, let's get you in there right now because by this time, even though I don't have a very good sense of smell, I could smell something and it wasn't pleasant. So we wheeled them into the shower room and myself and another volunteer and the man was sitting there and the stench was already so overwhelming that I also have kind of a weak stomach. I was kind of starting to gag a little bit. And I'm sorry for those of you who have eaten breakfast. This is gonna be kind of a nasty story. Um, but the man um, really couldn't get his, his shirt off. He was just, he was such a kind of a weakened condition. So uh, Ashley, another volunteer myself, started to take his shirt off. And this is the nasty part. As his shirt came off, his skin came off too. And then stuff started to drop to the floor. And that's when I had to leave the room because I, I went outside and started to throw up. And I said, well, this is service. <laughs> went back in and we got him undressed. And as we were, when I went back in, I said to Kathleen, call an ambulance. This man, this is way beyond what we can do. So she called an ambulance and we, so we kept getting the man sort of undressed, the ambulance arrived and they said, we cannot take him to the med until he has showered. There's no shower facility in the emergency room and he needs to be cleaned up. Uh, the guy was in a wheelchair because he was a double amputee. Um, and it turns out that he had been sitting in his own filth for several weeks and the, the maggots had started to eat away his flesh. That's, so we eventually got him showered um, and the paramedics got him on a gurney. And of course the shower room was, no one else was gonna shower the rest of the morning. And they wheeled him out. It was sort of like on those football injuries where the guy puts his thumb up. He was doing that and all the guests were just so respectful and supportive. We didn't hear one word about, hey man, when's my shower? Nothing like that. We just said, you know, every guest was 100% supportive. They went up around him as he was being loaded into the ambulance and said, we're with you, man. We, you're in our prayers. We hope you're gonna be okay. 
and then off he went. When I um, got home that night, I was sharing that story uh, with some friends, and I hadn't cried up to that point, but I just broke down in tears. Because I, and I was angry too, I was kind of shaking between being filled with grief and anger. Uh, the grief for this man who had gotten into such a condition and somehow somebody knew to wheel him to Mana House for help. But I was also angry that he'd be on the streets, that he would have been in such a state of neglect. And I wasn't really sure who to be angry with. Um, I mean, I had some ideas, but it just, it, the, the sort of, the, the whole situation was just so overwhelming. And I was thinking to myself too and reflecting, I was like, how, and excuse my language, how in the hell did I get into this? I, and I felt almost like, like a St. Francis who had kissed a leper. Just, I mean, it was just the, like, it was so repulsive and yet, just had to be done. Now, how, what's that got to do with God? That's how God responded to the Israelites who were in slavery. That God, and God heard the cry, the moaning and the groaning of those who were in slavery. And God said, something has to be done. I have to liberate them from this horrific condition of slavery. And imagine, I mean, slavery is lots worse than what this man had experienced in the wheelchair. Because in slavery, your body com is completely, your life is completely under the control of another who has no regard for your well-being at all. You are just a thing to be used. God hears the cry of those slaves and acts on their behalf to free them from slavery. It's the most profound event in the entire Old Testament, and that's why the prophets and everybody keeps referring back to this crucial moment of God identifying with the slaves. In fact, if you study the Old Testament, uh, there is no creation story without the Exodus story. The Exodus story is the creation story for the Israelites. So we turn then to what is God's love and compassion. And I didn't even have to say click. I mean, this guy here just knows. <laughs> He's following along. Um, in the Old Testament, Rakam, uh, Hebrew for the womb, God feels in God's womb. So much for God being male, right, ladies? <laughs> God feels in God's womb the suffering and the pain and the slavery of the people of Israel. And in the New Testament, there's that word that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. <laughs> it's a long Greek word, but it, what it means in our language is guts. And Jesus is often moved in his guts. Sometimes when you read, read that he was moved with anger, that's the word that's getting translated. The man with the withered hand. Jesus is moved in his guts to heal that man with the withered hand. That morning at Manor House, I was moved in my guts in a way that I didn't really appreciate. <laughs> um, but that, but the, the service that we are called to do to be holy as God is holy is to be moved in our guts, to feel intensely with those who are on the outs, those who are on the margins. So that's our identification um, with those who are in suffering in our gut. So I'm going to have you turn to the next slide. Click. This service um, takes kind of two aspects then, and I've already been talking about the one, actually I've been talking about both of them, but I'm going to just draw them out in a little bit more detail at this point. The first aspect of service is that we act like God did for justice. So sometimes we, we get this false dichotomy between charity and justice. And I don't really like the word charity so much. I like hospitality better. 
Um, but even then, people draw a dichot or draw a, such a sharp distinction, they become two separate things that there's justice and there's love, or there's justice and there's hospitality. And what I want to suggest is that there is no love without justice, and there is no justice without love. The two go together, and that's how it works with God. So think for a minute, we'll back away a little bit from kind of the fancy stuff of hospitality and we'll get more mundane. Uh, if you're in a love relationship with somebody else, can you be unjust to them and really be loving? No. Can you really uh, hate those that you seek justice for? No, we have to have some sense of, of love for them, a desire for their well-being. The two go together. So love has a dimension of self-sacrifice, perhaps, that justice doesn't. But even that gets a little complicated because one of the struggles that we have in our society right now is that um, justice is going to demand self-sacrifice, at least on the part of some people. So we have big arguments, for example, about the redistribution of wealth. Wealth can't be redistributed, which justice requires that wealth be redistributed, without somebody's wealth being redistributed. <laughs> and we sometimes want to talk as if, no, that's not. You can have justice without sacrifice. No, you can't. Racial reconciliation or justice in this society, we can't get to racial justice until we do a couple of things. One is to repent of the wrongdoing, not only of the past, but of the present. And also, we have to do penance. And in the Roman Catholic tradition, doing penance isn't like just giving stuff up. It's actively doing something to repair the harm that was done. So I'm sure we could, I can open up this huge can of worms by saying one word, reparations. I'm talking about ra uh, racial justice still. But we have a lot of wealth that was created and still is being created through racial injustice in this society. And we can't get to racial justice until we first admit that and then second, do something about it to redistribute the wealth. That's how God works. That's why we have in the Old Testament something called Jubilee in which wealth is redistributed. And there's big arguments about biblical scholars about whether or not that actually ever happened, and I don't know, but the, the teaching is there. That in order to get to economic justice, there has to be redistribution of wealth. And that's what hospitality does on a kind of level of interpersonal relationships. It's a redistribution of wealth. How does Manor House work? We rely 100% on donations. That means people of some means give some of their means to us so that it can be redistributed. And I, it's not coerced, except maybe if you go to church and you hear Matthew 25, 31 and following, and Jesus says, redistribute wealth or go to hell. <laughs> That's kind of a coercion, Jesus, <laughs> right? So you might say it's not a law, like it's not a government law. Well, you're right, it's, maybe it's not a government law. It's worse. It's a divine law. And it's pretty coercive. Do this or go to hell. Or in the Old Testament, I've set before you life and death. Which one are you going to choose? It's your choice. It's not much of a choice, is it? Well, I choose death. But that's... That's this aspect of service that is justice. It's kind of unpleasant. That's why I started with that first, because that's, especially for those of us who have means, we're being asked, not just asked, commanded to redistribute our wealth if we're going to follow in God's way of service. Now, there's another way of service which is the service of a kind of ministry of presence, that God is simply with us, taking care of our needs. Um, I believe you probably had a, a reading from the Old Testament this morning. Do you remember what it was? The Israelites were complaining about the water after they were out of 
That's correct. The Israelites are in the desert, and they're thirsty. <laughs> they're thirsty, which is no surprise. If you go into a desert after a while, you're going to get thirsty. And there's this great question at the end of the reading. Does anybody remember that question? Right at the end of the reading it comes. They explain, you know, that, that these funny-sounding names, and then they say this is because the Israelites had asked this question. Is God in our midst or not? What a great question. We need to ask that question a lot. Is God, is God in our midst or not? And how did the Israelites come to know that God was in their midst? It wasn't anything fancy, it was just water. God's presence known in, well, it is pretty life-sustaining though, isn't it? Water, which is quite mundane. It's not, it's not a highfalutin, like redistribution of wealth, social policy kind of stuff. It's just like clean water, water that we can drink. So we get that ministry of presence from God. We've got the justice work of the, the Exodus, and the Jubilee, and then we've got the ministry of presence, which is the other way in which God serves. God is simply present, taking care of our basic needs. Now, when we apply these to hospitality, so I'm narrowing it down just to what do we do in terms of hospitality. Hospitality like God, listens to our needs. So when we were starting Manor House, uh, we went to people on the streets and we said, what do you need? And we were told very clearly what was needed. A place where we can hang out, a sanctuary, a place where we can feel welcomed, and a place where we can get a shower and a change of clothes. I said, okay, we can do that. Those things, that's not that complicated. We don't even have to get approved by the health department to do that, right? I mean, because we're not serving food. Simple. We can just open a house. It's not that simple, though, because we have to keep practicing these three things in order to keep offering hospitality. The first is respect. Just as God respects the Israelites by listening to them, and I'm going to come to listening in just a bit, and God respects the Israelites in their dignity as human beings to free them from slavery. We have to offer respect to those who come through the front door uh, at Manna House. That respect is based upon not anything that people are doing, but simply that they're made in the image of God. So we see those who are coming across that threshold as the bearers of God's presence. And that enables us then to serve. Because then the service is not like, oh, see what a great thing I'm doing or that we're doing. It's not that at all. It's what a great honor and privilege it is to be able to serve those who are God's representatives in this world. Now that starts to turn things around. Instead of me getting the big head like, oh, what a great servant of God I am because I'm serving those people. It's the other way around. What a privilege that God comes to this little house in this little neighborhood in Memphis and says, here I am. So that's the respect. Now, of course, we also expect our guests to respect each other as made in the image of God and to respect even us volunteers as made in the image of God. And so that brings us to boundaries. We have expectations for ourselves as volunteers, and we have expectations for our guests. Just as God, in freeing the Israelites from slavery, didn't just say, okay, you're free, now go do whatever you want. There's a covenant that emerges out of liberation. And the, that covenant is boundaries. There are things that we're expecting each other to do in order to be, to live in such a way that we are consistently living as if we're made in the image of God. And so we have boundaries like no um, dehumanizing, denigrating, or disgusting language. So if you call somebody a bad name, you're warned. And you call somebody a bad name again, we'll see you tomorrow. 
And if you don't leave when we say we see you tomorrow, then we'll see you in a week. And if you still don't want to leave, now we're going to see you in a month. And you still don't want to leave? Ladies and gentlemen of the Manor House, because so-and-so won't leave, we are now closing. And then everybody turns and says, come on, man, leave. And usually that's enough. We have had to close a couple of times, though, because we knew that we couldn't continue to practice hospitality. A boundary had been so violated that it just couldn't, hospitality was no longer possible. So we had to close for the day. It's only happened maybe six times in our eight year history. But that's boundaries on language, boundaries on touch. So there's certain forms of touching that are not appropriate. Uh, and basically that means if you don't wanna to be touched, you're not supposed to be touched. Uh, and also for, um, we have certain guests who have real problems with this in relationship, particularly to some of our women volunteers. So that's no touch rule for them at all. Um, we have expectations too that you're not gonna cut in line if we're like in the morning taking the list for people to get on the showers. If you cut in line, then uh, the first you, you will be last. So you can go to the end of the line. Uh, and we just don't play around with that stuff because it's crucial for hospitality to have those kinds of boundaries. And then finally, listening and learning. We try to listen to our guests and we try to learn from them. I said earlier about how we um, came up with the idea of the list. It was really from our guests telling us this is not working there's a better way to do this. And so we listen and we learn from them in terms of how to practice hospitality. We also listen and learn about how they're being treated on the streets of Memphis. And so we have joined with other organizations to uh, sometimes meet with the police to say to the police, look, what you're doing is inappropriate, it's unjust, it's unnecessary, it's uncalled for, and you need to stop. And so we've had some good conversations with the police about that. Okay, we're gonna to move to simplicity, click. Simplicity is rooted in God's simplicity. This is kind of interesting theology, I think. God is simple. That means God is not divisible. God is one. And so God as one calls us also to have integrity of character. Our challenge in our lives is to live with integrity when our, our loyalties are be, being divided by all sorts of demands upon our lives. So yes, we're disciples of Jesus, but we're also citizens of the United States of America. And we also uh, maybe work at FedEx. So we've got, and not only that, we're a parent. So we've got these different centers of identity and loyalty. How do we hold that all together? Uh, Jesus says in one of the Beatitudes, uh, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart is it's not about sexual ethics, it's about focus, keeping our eyes on the prize. And simplicity is how we practice keeping our eyes on the prize. So, you shall have no other gods before you. Um, that commandment against idolatry is a commandment that's rooted in the simplicity of God. When we have a multitude of gods, we get strung out. We lose our integrity, we lose our focus, and we end up being dispersed all over the place, and we don't do anything very well, and we certainly uh, do not serve anybody very well. So we'll go to the next slide. How do we practice simplicity? We have to get our priorities straight. So those, all those identities need to be ordered around the, our primary identity, which is that we're made in the image of God, that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And then everything else has to flow out of that. Now we, we could spend a lot of time trying to figure out how, how this works, but I'm just kind of giving you a principle to start thinking about at, at this point. So we're going to go to the next slide. Blessed are the poor in spirit. One way that we can practice this simplicity is to simplify our lives. 
So blessed are the poor in spirit is that we're in solidarity with those who are poor. How can we become people who are in solidarity with the poor? We need to simplify our lives. One area that in which we can do that, so see how I'm sort of narrowing, narrowing, narrowing down. One area of simplicity of life is with regard to our possessions. If we have a lot of stuff to take care of, then we spend a lot of our time carrying, caring and worrying about that stuff. And when we are caring and worrying about a lot of stuff, then we don't have time and energy for service. So each one of us would have to ask, how do we simplify our lives so that we can create space for service? And that's where I'm going to stop. Um, we're going to uh, have a little bit of time for some questions, just a few minutes. And then next week we'll pick up with sacrifice, and I think you can see how that fits already with simplicity, uh, and strength, because we're not going to be able to do any of this stuff without God's strength. So a few questions, and then off you go back to church, those of you who haven't had good church yet. Yes, ma'am. I'm always torn, so I wanted to know what your position is. You know, out on the street, somebody says, can you spare a little mm -hmm. money? And so on the one hand, I want to give it. Uh, but then on the other hand, I'm torn whether that's the best or is that a good decision. Mm -hmm. So what's your position on that? Um, I regard... Um, Panhandling is like paying a street tax. So I carry uh, a certain limited amount of money that is available for those who panhandle me. It's usually five bucks. So I'll give up to that limit, and then after that I say no. So, and why do I give? Um, I give as a gift. So I don't make any judgments. If it's a gift, it's a gift. If I'm, if I'm worried about what they're going to do with it, if you're worried about that, just don't give. Uh, but I don't worry about that so much because I give gifts to all sorts of people and they do all sorts of things with them. So I figure it's, it's a gift, it's a gift, so I'll, I'll give. Um, and I don't want to hear a story. If somebody starts to tell me a story, I just say, look, man, you don't have to tell me a story. I'm giving you the five bucks. Here you go. Enjoy. Do whatever you want with it. Um, but if the next person comes up and says, hey, man, you know, give me some money, I said, I'm tapped out. I've already paid my street tax today. <laughs> so I, I just don't, I try not to make a big deal out of panhandling because um, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think it's bad if someone's um, nasty or aggressive to you or whoever else they might be asking. I was like, look, it's a gift. So if you want to be a jerk, I don't give gifts to jerks typically. So I'm moving on. Um, and I think in some, in some settings, people can feel, people being asked can feel kind of threatened or um, if you feel threatened, move away. Just, and when I'd say that if I'm all tapped out and, you know, I'm not going to give, then I just say, you know, I'm sorry, I'd really like to be able to help you, but I can't today. So I'll always try to treat the person with respect, as long as I'm being respected. If I'm not being respected, then I'd, I'd just leave. Sorry, man, you couldn't respect me. I can't respect you by meeting your, your uh, request. Sort of like responding to a cold call. <laughs> I mean, it's not that much different, right? I mean, they're panhandling. Uh, they're in your house on your phone, and they're panhandling. So I respond to them. You know, I'd be polite, and I either say yes or I say no. Um, so that's how, that's how I deal with that. And we don't give out any money at Mana House. Uh, one of the things that, that money is, Jesus wasn't kidding when Jesus said, you know, money is the root, or Jesus didn't say it, Paul did, money is the root of all evil. Um, it, it can really destroy relationships. So if you're just an ATM to somebody, that's not much of a relationship. And that's why I just give in a limited way. Where is Manahouse? Manahouse is at 1268 Jefferson. So if you go down Poplar, uh, and take a left on Cleveland, and then a right on Jefferson. We're about two blocks on your right. So we're right by Mississippi Boulevard Church. We're between Mississippi Boulevard Church and a, a bar. 
which is a great place for a place of hospitality between a church and a bar. We sort of see ourselves as the, the moderate median between those two extremes. <laughs> Any other questions? If people want to drop off clothes, mm -hmm. uh, can you do that on any morning, any day? Any morning we're open, Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday between 8 and 11.30. And if you can't make those hours, uh, don't throw things over the fence when we're closed. Uh, you can just drop them on my front porch at 53 North Auburndale. Any day or time, it's an enclosed porch. Just come out, I don't have a dog or anything. You can come out of the porch and just leave them on the porch. Thank you all. One more question, I'm sorry. Not typically. Um, I would, if you want to uh, offer food as a donation, I would give it to the St. Vincent de Paul Society that runs a soup kitchen about two blocks from us. And they serve a meal every day of the week uh, between 9.30 and 11 approximately. Uh, they're directly behind the Social Security uh, office there on Cleveland. It's that old church, part of which burned down a number of years ago. That's where they are. And they'd be happy to take food donations. Um, I was part of a group that um, volunteered yesterday morning at the St. Mary's Soup Kitchen uh -huh. in downtown. And they said, oh, Saturday tends to be our lighter day because St. Mary's Cathedral also does it. And so kind of piggybacking on what you're just saying about St. Vincent de Paul, do all of these organizations or a lot of them that are doing similar services or at least serving the same people, do you all kind of have a... Oh, you a part of a network where you're understanding what other people are doing and <laughs> seeing holes or being able, how do you all work together or, or what can be done in order to fill some holes maybe that aren't there? June? There are 41 <laughs> agencies in Tennessee with 83 programs that work together in something called the Continuum of Care. There is a survival guide that's put out by Hope, which is one of the people that um, he works with, and we are very organized. We bring in six point five million dollars to serve people who are homeless every year in Tennessee and Tennessee. Well, there's the answer. Yeah, and, and June, by the way, uh, June Averett, who runs uh, OHC Outreach Housing and Community, is one of the best resources in Memphis on what's going on on the streets. And June takes an approach to homelessness that we share at Mana House. We're kind of at different points on that continuum. But housing first. People say, why are people ho homeless? Because they don't have homes. <laughs> right? It's not that com it is complicated to sort of keep people in homes sometimes. But all of the other stuff, if you ask why are people homeless, you know, drug addiction, uh, mental illness, don't have a job, all, all those things can't be addressed until somebody has a home. So you just... You know, everything, thing, I'm glad someone's sort of clapping there. Um, housing precedes employment, sobriety, education. Imagine trying a job. Imagine trying to work without a place to go home to at night. It's, or try to get a job without a home address. It's just not possible. So uh, the great work that June and her organization does is it gets people into housing and it supports them in a way so that they can stay in housing. Uh, and because of that, a number of people who uh, were homeless guests at Mana House, now they still come to Mana House occasionally, uh, but they're not homeless anymore. And then in fact, they become resources for people who are still on the streets. So we're like, Mana House is like this big open funnel, we're at the big open end of the funnel. And then hopefully we're kind of funneling people towards folks who can actually get them off the streets. There is no dignity in being homeless in the sense of it's a horrible, horrible existence. Homelessness is hell. It's, it's a slavery on the streets. And the more we can get people into housing, uh, the more their, the dignity that they have can be restored. So. If, if you're thinking about, boy, I, I sure would like to write a big check to an organization that gets people off the streets, June. No, she didn't pay me. This is, this is an unsolicited endorsement, but she's doing best work in the city. Is that so, front, though? I mean, you sure? 100% sure. And we are supported by Grace St. Luke's, and I thank you for those kind words. Grace St. Luke's.
Thank you, Grace St. Luke's. Thank you, everybody. I'll see you next week.